Ma please, let's. Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Come and walk. Let's start the workshop. Please, those who are outside of the hall, come inside and let's uh, begin Fatima. the workshop. Fatima, the suit. All our symbol are good. Are people already joining online?
past president of the uh, association, Professor Fortune. I'm sorry. I don't think anybody today. I don't think. Professor Fortune, I'm sorry, sir. He's uh, all the way from Kuna and is the past president of this association. Apure, all the way from Apure. You're welcome, sir. Please, uh, ma'am, I think someone to read the uh, prop. Bolani. Bolani. Yeah. Bolani. 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 Bolani.
Did you know? Citation of the person is a abolition. The he graduated from the University of Utah and the University of Waterbooks, where he obtained his degrees in English language, comparative literature, and African literature, respectively. But as great as English for academic purposes, he is an expert. He is also a strategist in blended learning and integration of technologies and curriculum. He was a project officer for the British Council, the British Council for Education Space Project for the University of Technology in Nigeria between 1989 and 1993. He specializes in English and communication and blended learning with nearly 40 years of teaching experience across the educational levels. In 2007, Professor Peter Adebayo Abouchani received the Commonwealth for Academic Staff Fellowship and visited the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom as a senior research fellow, where he took up the challenge of, integrate, of integrating technology into the language teaching curriculum. A worldwide adventure for him, as he considers it one of the ways of having large classes particularly in our, in our time. It is of notable interest that in the past decade and a half, his research work focuses on technology integration in curriculum innovative pedagogies, learning spaces, curriculum development courses design, blended learning to distance learning, learning mobile learning, he currently leads the Puta Blended Learning Research Group on using Moodle LSM as a university wide virtual learning environment platform and has spearheaded other groups and teams on integrating technology into teaching and learning. Professor Adebayo Abouishane has presented his research findings on e learning, blended learning, and mobile learning in many conferences in reputable institutions and gatherings like Durham, Durham University UK, e-learning Africa, Dakar Senegal, and Lusaka Zambia, Gambia, Tabib University UK, and ICL University of Toronto, Canada. iPad, iPad Foundry. Tanzania, Cape Peninsula University of Technology. He has also led workshops on blended learning at the e-learning African conference and at several institutions in Nigeria. He served as a member of the e-match Africa, Africa Educational Technology Network for African, African Health at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. Currently, he is the principal investigator of the research group working on a project titled A Pedagogical Adaptive Model and Framework of Blended Learning for Higher Education Institutions for Employability in Nigeria. Be a 2019 Tech Fund National Research Fund grant. Ladies and gentlemen, join me to welcome this astute scholar. A professor of English and communication to this August graduate, Professor Peter Adebayo. Thank you, Dr. Distinguished colleagues. It's my pleasure to stand before you this afternoon. I'm not presenting a paper. I'm leading a workshop. And for the fact that we're not all here, 
it's virtual. I always prefer workshops that are hands on. Because from this workshop, you must learn to do one or two things. You don't go away saying, Aborisha did say this, Aborisha did say that. Aborisha did made me learn to do this. And that is what this is about. If anybody had been a part of this conference today and listened to our keynote speaker, and our plenary presenter, Professor Rehiku, you would know that the conference we are gathered for have a lot to do. Those of us who are very sharp to must be prepared to deep and deep into all the things they have presented before us. We need to be able to do hard and long. Both the things of what we are teaching and intend to be teaching, and in terms of our research, Professor Aguare challenged us, and we must take up that challenge. There are huge problems. And part of being that is what this workshop is about. In 2013, we had an open day. We are waiting for you. So, this afternoon, I'm leading this presentation on technology supported learning 
and language. My friend is somebody I took an interest in. First met him in 2009 at the conference in the UK. He came to Europe. He knows. But it's somebody who has done a lot of work with professors. Then he told the story of how an engineering professor in the US is an American. Professor engineering gave their student to grasp a particular concept in engineering. They tried all the good methodologies, new pedagogies, and all that. The student was, they continued to have a problem. Then somebody suggested, let's see if we can get a game that can teach this concept. They then thought of come to go to. My friend is somebody who's been developing games for education. And they went to my friend. He said, it took them months pouring over the matter. He trying to understand the problem the engineering professors were trying to solve. Eventually we got and he built the game. He built the game and the students couldn't get up the game. Students who found it very difficult to understand. Now they did so in groups and were outperforming other students in other institutions on this particular concept. And they made it a part of the curriculum. So, when Professor Ekorani and Professor Ishiku were talking about innovation, this is what you do. You, as a teacher of English, you get into class and you find your students are sleeping any time you see in your class. Very easy for us. Those students are useless. They don't want to learn. We forget to ask ourselves why do the students find it difficult? It means a little laboratory. This was what led us in a way to explore integration of technology. We knew our students did in the University of Science and Technology. First, they are said bye bye to English. So sad in Nepal. Jump, they have to live up with it. They manage to get it to get to the university. You now bring them into the university, you see it. Use of English. I don't need it anymore. And we put it into class. 1,000, 2,000, and the numbers started climbing. You then threw my president in front of that class. And he starts, he starts speaking for me. And you know, you say, what is on me? She's just wasting her time. So, we need to bring in something to get the students engaged. That's how we started. So, my president said, too many teachers see education as preparing kids for the past. Not and that's what many of us do, not only in English, even in the sciences, even in social sciences, in the whole of humanities, in our culture. 
we are not joining the things for the future in any case the skills required for the work place of the future we don't know uh, the team of who was the accept is an accountant If we need an accountant in the future, we don't know. We need to do this try balance or whatever the balancing act is that they teach. We don't know. We need to teach our students to be able to work in the future. Now, as language teachers, I have a question. What's your digital literacy level? Yes, all of us are in this phone now. Most of us do calls, text messages, WhatsApp, and that way. And you have a smartphone in your phone. What percentage of the capabilities of the smartphone do we use? Let's start from there. What percentage? 5%, 10%. Most of us use less than 10%. The vast majority would use less than 5% of the capability. Engineer. Less than one percent, and you know better because you know the capabilities of some of the folks. And when you see some of us, mine is a Samsung for the data, it's an S8 data. Samsung is now S2021, and I'm on it. And I have not used up to five percent of the capabilities of it. But you see, many of our people they are running after the latest to do what to then get both. So, what's your digital literacy level? Please, every teacher who is here today. I want you to note down somewhere what your digital interest in that is. Is it a beginner, intermediate, or advanced? Note it down because we are coming back to it. Digital learning technologies and language teaching. The changes in global socioeconomic landscape and the impact of technology demands a review of teaching approaches and practices. When we talk about teaching approaches, we are talking about the theories. Those of us who teach in professional universities in the Department of English, we can come into the class and talk about the history of English. We can start from the Victorian to the Elizabethan to the, you know, and go on and on and on and on like that. Very good, very good. Very good. Very, very good. The question today is about learning. How do we learn? There is a whole lot of theory of learning. How we learn. If we don't know how we learn, how do we know how to teach? We can start from the B.F. Skinner to G.P. to the Bicotsky. To the remote list of the bring all of these theories together 
and steal and preach who benefit the wrong student. How do they learn? Have you ever bothered to find out how your students are learning? For instance, many of you don't realize that our students even prefer to be taught that some of their own. They find a student who knows a little bit better than they know. And they prefer to learn from them than from you, the experts. No students prefer that. The few students prefer to go to the experts. And when the few learn from the expert and they sit down, you see all the other students surrounding them. So they want to let them. That's part of how you learn. If you don't know that, and you want to make an expert of every student who comes into your class, you are going to end up being frustrated. What are the best teaching practices? That we need to engage. We need to find out. What are some of the tools that are most appropriate to teach? What are some of the media we need to leverage? We need to examine. Uh, how much knowledge of the area we have ourselves. Other than reading our lecturer's books and promoting their path to the new generation. How much of it can we really explain? So it comes into your class. Very brilliant. How do you mean? Very brilliant to the young work for work, what the rest of the jobs. Explain it to me so that I can understand it. It's, it's a very difficult concept. You know? No, I don't know. That's why I have you here to explain it to me. We need to begin to understand what our roles are. Are we all of Once I stand there as a professor and I'm reading out, you are writing furiously throughout one or two hours because the oracle is speaking. You don't even have a single thing to reflect. To try to understand, to question what I'm saying. And many lecturers, they even tell you, don't give me part of what I give you. You may be able to get 50% or 60%. That's enough for you. Some will tell their students, you want to get an A in my course. Hello. Is that your course? Let us try out to teach this course. You need to teach it back because. And we need to be the students. What about our competencies? I don't talk about. Using this smartphone. And you need to open your students in this So that every minute of the day, they can do something relating to the course you are teaching them. And you meet them there. So we need to up our day. Changes in learning theories demand transition from the teacher centered classroom to the student centered classroom. 
the teacher center classroom is like I am now here. And I'm talking and I expect you to be writing curiously because every word is important that I drop. I want to see it in the exam for the test. That's where the problem Rules based language teaching. You know the rules. Coco. You can read up the rules. I was in the UK in the classroom as a supporting teacher in an MA class. That was 2007. And the main lecturer was talking about it was a grammar class. And I adopted it because I'm a sports enthusiast. I just picked up this word that we use. That was the English word. Gifty. Gift. Not be gifty. It was on common day by 2007. So the government was talking about this and that, and I said, Are you aware they also use it as a verb? English woman. I said, Yes, it. He did it. He may go scoring opportunity. And yes, listen to Paul commentary. Yes, you know what? Coming from the teacher, <laughs> you know what you're talking about. And the following class, it became a talking point because the younger members who are English in the class, it was an international, it was a mixed class. So the international students weren't so. But the English ones don't knew about it. They came up with a lot of examples. So language cheap and language is cheap. So if you are a rule-based teacher, rather than skill-based or task-based language teacher, Textbook, notebook, it's all you know. You can make references to online resources. You don't know how to share links. You don't even know how to require your students to send links outside the world. In your, in your textbook, you are not helping them. Because today, the kids we teach, we even prefer to read online than to read your textbook. So, if you have a textbook that is so important, find other material, other resources online. Complement to help if you want to be more And then brick and mortar cloud to innovate learning spaces. We are the brick and mortar now, but why a good number of our colleagues are joining us virtually? That's a plan they are into. They are not here. So you sit down in the classroom and you say, I didn't see you in the class last week. The week before you were not there. Some of us even have adult students. Some of them are even married. Some of them are working. And you think they are going to be in class every time? Some of them have not eaten for a couple of days. 
So there's trouble to come to pass. So we must not insist. They must always be there. Let's meet them in other classrooms. And they will be there. Advancement and strengths of digital learning technologies. That's what I mean by DLTs. Digital learning technologies. They enable experiential learning. Learning from people's experiences. When students watch videos, just make sure which you today does not like watching videos. Very rare to find any young person, any teenager that you cannot capture with video clips. We all do not to WhatsApp videos that are spreading, including the terrible ones that we get. When Professor Eguare in the morning was talking about the antipathy in our society, and how communication fails the antipathies in our society. Many of the times in those videos or messages that we submit, poor as the language may be, some of the writers write a typical language. We condone it. We say, focus on the message. Not the message because some of those messages fit our own narratives. And this that so experiential learning helps and experiential learning can be can be done from some of the things that we have using technology. Greater interaction. What is lacking in most classrooms is interaction. That was what was lacking in our old classrooms. We are teaching language, use of English, and we could not get the students to interact either amongst themselves or even with the lecture. That was not there. And you need to create opportunities for them to be able to interact. Why do they need to bring something like that? And you see that your students will not put you up. Enhance student engagement and achievement. If students are engaged, if they are engaged with your materials, if they are engaged with your lectures, you will see improved student outcomes. Provide engagement. Independence of single source of information. It's even very important for them to be able to evaluate the information they receive in the face of fake news, which is the theme of communication in our society today. Fake news. Let them be able to get information from many other sources. Teach them to do that and to evaluate the information they are receiving. The DLTs help motivation. Students are motivated when they see that they can do this, they can do that, and so on. Authentic materials for study. Autonomy. Set and lose. Throw a question at your students. Go and find the answers. Let them understand. In many cases, there is no one right answer. There are many right answers. And that's what life is about. There is no one rule. No, I think you are going to heaven. If you are going to heaven, you can say yes. There is only one path to heaven. But in life, there are many paths. Global is on both will be equal to global understanding. 
So here you have 21st century learning. I've used, I used this uh, graphic at a workshop in 2013. The Lizard University conference. The traditional one is you have to read from pages 12 to 36, and tomorrow you will answer 20 questions about the topic. How many of us do that? Or let me say, how many of us don't do that? The first is the first two. Compare that to the flipped classroom, the flipped teaching method. Why don't you watch this video tonight? So we can discuss your ideas tomorrow. What the video tonight? Tomorrow come with your own ideas. When you are watching the video, ask questions. Come up with your own ideas. And see the kind of response you are going to get. See the amount of interaction you are going to get. See the kind of engagement you are going to get. It's okay. So, flip your practice. And that will flip your classroom. The teacher centered way is the oracle giving knowledge. I am the way and the light. But I'm not Jesus. How can I wait be the way and the light? I can shine the light in the dark currents of knowledge so that you will be able to see where knowledge is leading and make a meaning out of it. You can discuss the idea and come to an understanding. But in the old traditional way, the teacher centered classroom and the oracle. Whatever I say, like the past, is the only truth. Textbook transfer of knowledge. Knowledge is in mind. You see this book? That is source of knowledge. Really put it in your head, and you have knowledge. That knowledge will not help any creativity. Any innovation, it belongs in the past. You can get ideas from that to create a new world. This is the curriculum. We must cover all the What I am, I throw back at you, and after that, don't ask me.
for the next time. When they get there, one for people are saying, Why are they paying in you? Ask your student whether you are paying that. Because of the large numbers, you know they won't, you won't be able to take attendance. But when you put your work online, attendance is taken automatically. Every second, any student spends on a DLA, there's a record of it. Every student, every second, there's a record of it. When assignments are online and you don't look at it and you be without attempting it, there's a record that you just yeah. look and you do not attempt it. So we need to set ourselves, we need to we, we can do so. So get one or two guys. You wonder how I'm going to find out. I'm going to find out. We already have everybody's email. And I'm going to be reaching you after this. I'm going to be inviting those who have done anything to an online workshop. To teach you how to use technology to support to teach. Let's start from there. Are you a gamer? How many of us play games on our phone? Engineer, you play games. Well, yeah, yeah, doesn't matter. Even when, even when you are not bored, sometimes, yes, when you want to unwind, when you are sitting alone and you are doing nothing and you think, okay, let me get myself and doing something, you play games. What many of us do to we, some of us who have children or who have uh, wards or who have younger ones in the home, when they are playing games, uh -huh. Is that what you are? Well, take your book and start to read. You do not even understand that the things are so as important as books. Why? Most of the things that you see teach people about strategy and their endeavors. You are completely this level, you go to the next level. You go to the next level. The kids have the sense of accomplishment when they have attained a particular level. There is competition. Let me competition among the kids. What level are you on this game? I'm on this level. Ah, I, mean, I don't I don't leave you behind. And it's like, hey, I'm going to get there. There is no competition. Now, what do we do? Even when the games are not ones that you are interested in, look in and see what is happening. Divert their attention from those things. Introduce language learning games. So I said, are you a gamer? There are loads of them online. What game? Keep your mind sharp. Sentence master. Okay? You want to teach sentences. How to build sentences. Think complex compound and all of those things. You can use games to teach sentences. But you yourself must learn how to build it. So that you can learn. And you can introduce competition in your own Learning how to build sentences. Let them compete. What are you doing?
Those of us in purpose linguistics, for example, there are things out there that will teach you how to analyze purpose and corporate. There are apps. Every area of magic now, you will get an app. But you need yourself to learn to use it before you can use it. So, who would like to learn a game? Yeah, only one person. Two, three, four, five, six. Seven, great. Now all the seven will teach me one game. When we are having our online workshop, we are going to get to you, and that's where it's good. Including those who are online, though. A hand. I can't see your hands here, too. I need to see your hands because we are going to get to you. Send a chat. Send a chat. So that we will reach you. Everyone who indicates will get an email. And we are going to agree on two, three, four, five topics for the workshop online that will continue after this particular workshop. Now questions. Hello. Thank you so much, sir. And then, what's your name? Show your name. I learned a lot from this, but I was also talking to Dr. Dumbo that we should have managed to get our staff to be a particular for this session. What to learn language? Because you you rightly pointed out to me before. The entire technology used to put man on the moon is now up to one quarter of what it's now. The technology they used in 1969 to put the full amount on the moon is now up to one quarter of what it is in now. Okay. Most of the video recording we are doing now, right. we are using phones, transferring it to the system. Yes. So what we are just do with the phone is just enormous. Well, because our people are very resistant to change. We, we and that is why, uh, to give it to the director here, if you see something, you will first of all get whatever version, but you must sit down inside to develop our own. That was how we are. We have. We started with those ones, but it does manage the ICT. So we must develop something and give it within a very short time. The other one, I think, it, and the only thing I play for now is just word solver. It's not word solver. So I just, just different words, just like maybe some more play with different. But people are scared of me because people are scared of Yeah. Uh, the vice chancellor said about three years ago that uh, YouTube is very fast. So we are starting to close it to school. And I was just saying, that was what we used to learn software. Because the results introduced it to you, I went to the last of this moment. The results introduced it to you, okay. Just casually, okay. then it's your business to add concerning that you go and eat. So you also go to the YouTube, but when you look for the topic, and you see somebody who have used it, put it in there, then by the time you go to two, three, four, five videos, you become an expert in that software. It's just as simple as that. So your phone is so timely. I don't know how you will do it. We will talk to Dr. Nibu Kubo. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, let me quickly ask you this something so that I don't forget this brain is getting old somehow. I don't know. 
Good point. Absolutely great point. That's what you get with technology and what we are getting now with technology. You don't need very, very sophisticated equipment today to do a whole lot of things. My president here, as part of our project, we set up a recording studio. The university, we requested for a studio long ago, how many years ago, more than seven years ago. 2019, 2020, when COVID was coming, it was working. That one had awarded it to somebody who knew absolutely nothing about studio. So, because of the project we were on, we decided to set up our own little one. We are not about the green light. We have somebody to find out the green light. Fortunately, we were able to get not a very high spec, uh, what do you call it? Hmm? Not, no, not the whole the uh, tripod of which we mounted. Uh, the one they use in the television studio. We got one. And we use our own phone. We had a printer to print a banner that is uh, this long, placed at the back, which gives us the kind of backdrop that we wanted. And we have a studio. A student of mine, before she graduated from not too well known family, started doing a little bit of training and business and so on. And she wanted to do this face uh, painting that we meant with a uh, makeover or whatever. And was paying a lady in town so much money to learn it. I said, hey, come. Why do you need to do that? I said, I want to learn too, so that I can be earning some money. I said, but you have a smartphone. Say, yes, I have a smartphone. I said, what do you need to do? Just type in how to, how to, whatever it is you want to do. How to do makeover. There are loads of things that we teach you. All the materials, where you can get them and all this. The one, the broad, the feet, the plate, the All manner of things. I said, that's me. How did I get to know? My son was doing post grad. And his professor said he should use uh, a technique to do some analysis. Nobody in the department knew how to use that package. But his professor had read about it. And from people who had used it and wanted him to use it by all means. He eventually ended up on YouTube. That's where he then. To use the From that thing, uh, this, this is where it is. There is absolute. You want to fix your room? Go to YouTube. How to fix a living room? How to do this? How to paint? How to climb? You will get. Notes. So this is what I'm saying. We are not using this thing for anything at all. So the engineer is correct, and I'm glad he made that intervention. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I have seen most of our classes. They're so dry. What you are telling us now, we have two hours to take 
Thank you very much. And uh, I'm wondering, when you're upset, which time do you advocate to, you know, to save all this extra time for those things? I, was, I don't know, I put it down the that's all right. As I said, that's what drove us to technology. When we started using technology, we didn't have anybody to teach us what we can do. We were in the dark. Okay? But I tell you, we were only two hours. How many hours do we have? Two hours. Or we make our students work like 10 hours a day. We use up the two hours. We then tell them, what is this video? Go to this thing. Go to that. We target specific materials for them to put on our ear. When we did an evaluation at the point. So the said, wow, I've never seen this. I'm going to say this to the whole world. All our colleagues in the Italian who make fun of us in Italy that we are, you know, third rate university and all of that. I'm cooking this now and I'm learning, I'm listening to this, I'm watching this. They will do their assignments. They love it. So we have two hours given to us by the university. We make the students work 10 hours. And they love working the 10 hours. That is the advantage that we are talking about. And when they engage with the materials, when they come to test for exam, you see the now I must. One, don't get your students working online and get them to the classroom to come and take a pen and paper exam. Oh, I'm not saying don't give them the pen and paper exams. All the points at which you are giving them work must count. Okay, that is the evaluation. Any other? Okay. These are props for the information that you have given to us. I just want to share our experience in the school now. Just like the, uh, my colleague said, uh, they have a, a lot of students and they have just two hours for duty. One thing that we did was that. In order to make the students participate in the work, in the, in the learning, turning it from teacher center to um, teacher center, we divided them into groups and gave them you know, topics to work on. And they had to present the groups to present. So it became a competition. You know, we wanted to help you know, one another. So the fact that we have given them something to work on to come and report. Makes them to work. And then they are eager, they will come to your class because they are eager to come and present so that others will be able to pick for that and show up in the work in the So that, yes, and they ask questions to others. When they are presenting, when, when they have finished the work, the others are to ask questions. And you know, they want to ask questions so that they will, do, and they will drive those ones down so it became interesting. That was one method that we used. Thank you very much, Prof. Okay. Thank you so much for the information. I just want to ask something of uh, the attitude, attitude of the language, the type of language that we have in the technology. Those who have started so far, 2009, okay, one, we want to look at the attitude of the type of language that we have here. The attitude of the teacher, you know, you just don't know this at all. Are we prepared? Are we technological? I mean, the technology, are we compliant? 
then the attitude of other lecturers. So I don't want you to share with us that. Okay, maybe a great experience or a bit of that experience. I mean, how have you been able to carry along the institution, the, the other, you know, uh, teachers or instructors, okay, who are not from humanity? That's my lady. It's not a During my sabbatical year, I saw something at the Christmas University. It was good. for teaching and uh, in some cases we send in uh, recorded uh, video uh, lectures to them to see them. However, through the group classroom, many of them feel that they are not in class. So what we what I did was that uh, though there were not many I could, I, it's, it's not possible to do such, to practice such in a, a very large class. Say something for about 10 minutes or about 3 4 minutes. So, very good, that's not. Then I know you are not in class. So when I post something to you, they go ask. And the person could even respond instantly. That means that's I said that question here. Oh, you saw some person you are not in class. So I will write them, add them to write them so and so in, within a few minutes. Give me this. If you didn't give, give it to me at that point, at that point in time, that means you are not. And the vice chancellor actually approved that. Now, when time came for us for exam, the university introduced Placera for assessment. That's error. That's error for assessment. Uh, the problem with us is that uh, many of them they wrote journals. It was then we knew that uh, they were not actually participating in class. And uh, although you know it's a private university, the university has Very Let me start from a question. It, it remains the big problem in our system. We started over 10 years ago. How many people have we been able to convince to come? Only in our department. We had a few collaborators from computer science. They found it too difficult to continue and drop down. So, for, for the pandemic, necessity, they say, is the mother of the world. And it's the mother too. So, 
it is the necessity, and that is why you need the institutional head to be convinced that this is the way to go. We have proposed it. People have picked against two past chance now to try it. Change is the most difficult thing to bring the power. And particularly when it has to do with technology, the old brigade, they are so entrenched in their own ways, they don't want to. As we speak, we see how in our institution, older professors who want to do some work or access their email. On their laptop, we see them go to the we call our own IT, we call it computer resource center in our university. The student will carry the bag. The student will see the professor will sit open to the university email. My, my email is this. my password is this. So when the student reads out something that interests, oh, that is it. So, what year was it when we had uh, projectors and screens installed in all lecture theaters and classrooms in our university? And the university of Portugal was to train all lecturers to be able to prepare their course well. It was eight years ago. So we did that. I supervised the project and the coordination of all these projects. We took up land. About two, three years after, some people were looking for where to go. They didn't know who they were taking it. They are not taught to protect us. Hello? The church of us, we have given them a test here. Some people will take the template from this course, change the course name, change the course code, and leave everything and send it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the experience. The vice chancellor tried carrot and stick. Some people scramble, blah, 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 blah. So, well, after two or three months, if you don't get on, you are not going to receive your salary the Saturday war. So the vice chancellor had to drop it. And identify a few early adopters. Train them to one, two. That's what we have done in our own department. It was our language courses. Now we have the philosophy and sociology courses. Doing it in a little way, not as much as we would have loved to have them go. At least they are trying now. Okay. We are just because uh, GMS has now become an institute. Guess the name of the institute. It's the Institute of Technology Enhanced Learning and Digital Yes. For everybody in the Institute to follow the training course, we have to training course. So, this is the way it is in my regard. Dr. D.B., what you are doing at Christland, I, because of pandemic, I praise the effort. But in actual fact, the kids will want to go back. 
not the appropriate way. The same thing happened in the West. Most universities in the US are not leveraging technology the way, in spite of everything they've got. Uh, it would be hard. I could lay my hand if I could lay my hands on it. A lady posted on her Twitter. She got the head of a mannequin, which, yes, my mask is over there. Put a mask to cover the nose and mouth of the mannequin. Put it before Zoom. She was lying on the bed and sleeping. So the teacher thinks she's in the classroom. Because when this pandemic came, everybody started scrambling. Google uh, Microsoft Teams, Google Classroom, Zoom. It was okay with private university, small number of students. Imagine you had 200 students in a class. In my wife's department, biology, the lecturer was sharing his, uh, his slides. They took over the slides. They painted it all manner of colors. It had to come to the end because that book. <laughs> Students are sending you a message. We didn't consider the socioeconomic level of the students. How many of them could afford? In one day, you expect a student to have 10 gigabytes of data to attend lectures? And do that over a week. We found out in our project in gathering data that many of the kids didn't have smartphone. They use Tonosobe, and you are forcing them to so we are approaching it the wrong way, but you are to ask, asking about lecturers engineer has told us that the vice i mean the rector here has an interest that is very important to leverage that interest his colleague and friend at teleology federal poly has an interest we use their students and their lecturers as for our project. And he says, ah, he's a friend. He says, you are going to come back home. He said, don't worry, we'll, we'll teach you how to get around all of these issues. Okay? So when you have the vice chancellor of FUNAB, is somebody who came from a technology background from IITA. When we interviewed him as part of our project, he said he knows what this is all about and is quite on board. So he's supporting the university in that regard. And lecturers are keen into it gradually. It's a gradual process. We are going there. Prof. Professor Shotiloye, say what they did. If we start about what we are doing, 
the we won't we won't we won't finish today. On one of our courses, we have our students in small groups of five, maximum six. They embark on a project. On that project, they go out. We simulate interview in the classroom for the small groups. They go out to carry out and interview people. They go to sites, depending on the topic we are investigating. They come back. In their groups, they walk, they answer questions, they raise issues, they do, and they write a term paper. They also present in class. You need to see how enthusiastic the kids are about that. And you need to see how much they are learning on that course. That is the way to go. If we all can key into it in our own little ways, we will get somewhere. Innovation will come in. We will no longer be boring teachers. Engineer, you still have something to contribute. You ran away and left us. You are welcome back. Please give him the mic. We are running up the School of Engineering Conference, so I have a part to present, so I have to go out to present it. Yeah, what, you said something about data now. I, I could remember during the pandemic, the uh, Glow, MTN, and uh, Vodacom in Ghana, they provided free data because I was following them through uh, this Joy TV in Ghana for all students. All, the only data you need is just about two kilobytes to enter the portal of the school. Immediately you enter the portal of the school, you do you not pay anything again. I think we need to also leverage on this because Glow is a Nigerian. MTN, they have their largest share from Nigeria. So all of us still need to meet them. If they can do it for them free of charge in Ghana. Yeah. And they didn't do it here. We didn't so ask them. we didn't ask them. Okay, maybe <laughs> all of us should go there and ask. Eh? We need something innovative in that part because once data comes down, oh, this student will learn. They will and they will learn fast. Thank you very much for that example. They did exactly that in South Africa during the pandemic. The universities created like learning centers where they are equipped with laptops and Wi-Fi cable and all of that. Students who are in the rural areas, they got all the uh, service providers to come together and help the students. So they did something exactly like that. Nigeria, what do they do? Nothing. So until we get our government and our institutional heads to come together and do this, we won't move an inch. Thank you. We, there is a second workshop. So he's going to join virtually. I don't know. President. Are you in touch with Professor Wulabi? Is he ready now? Okay. So, the next workshop, please. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for your time. I think our time is far spent. So right now I want to introduce Mr. Abioe from General Studies Department, Federal Polytechnic, Ilaro. Thank you. To read the citation well. of Dr. Dario Professor Dari Uwulabi, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, permit me to read the profile of Professor Uluadari Michael Uwulabi. Yes. 
Yes. Um, we want to see the, the picture. All right, thank you. Professor Dari Oulabi was born some six decades ago in the now Bondo State, Nigeria. He had his primary education in the rustic community of his birth. He attended Ajua Grammar School, Okeagbe, Akoko, still in Ondo State. A erudite scholar graduated with the best results of Division I distinction in his set. This was under the strict discipline of the late famous Briton of Italian extraction, Chief Dr. Guy Gagulio. Professor Dario Wolabi proceeded to the University of Benin in 1979, where he obtained a bachelor's degree in English and literature. He obtained a master's degree in language arts from the University of Ibada and a PhD in English for specific purposes, ESP, a current area of interest in English language teaching and research. Our erudite scholar, Professor Owolabi, has taught at various educational levels and he is currently a professor of ESP, that is English for speci specific purposes, as a form of applied linguistics, which specialization in teaching English as a second language, TESL, applied linguistics and communication in English. He has published extensively in his area of research interest locally and internationally. Professor Michael Dari Uwulabi has had various administrative experiences in the university system. He was acting dean of arts and management science at the defunct the University of Education, Ikere Equity now part of Ekiti State University. Professor Ulabi happens to be the acting head, Department of Theatre and Media Arts and English and Literary Studies, Ekiti State University, Abu Ekiti. He is the current dean, Faculty of Arts in Ekiti State University, Abu Ekiti, Nigeria. Our uh, erudite scholar, Professor Dari Wolabi, has been an active member of the National Association of Teachers and Researchers in English and a sec as a second language from its inception, and was once a vice chairman of the association. He has also taken part in one uh, uh, various conferences. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you an erudite scholar, Professor Oluwadare Michael Owolabi, while we give him a standing ovation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Abiyo, for reading the citation of Professor Owolabi. Over to you now, sir. You're welcome, sir. Can you hear me, sir? You can present now, sir. Over to you, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Can you hear us, sir? Thank you. 
No, not that. Hello, sir. You have, you have not engaged the audio. You have not engaged the audio. If you can engage the audio, leave the meeting and re enter again. We will accept you in another point. Please activate the audio, activate the video. This audio is not on the screen. It's just your audio, sir. Hello, sir.
Okay, yes. Yeah. Alice. Yes. Hello? Hello, Hello, sir. Hello? Yes. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. I can hear you. Hello? Hello, sir. I, we can hear you. Please increase. I can, you. I can hear you too. You're welcome, sir. You're welcome, Thank Professor. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hello? Hello, sir. I seem to have voice. Hello? Hello, sir. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Hello? Uh, I've lost you again. Oh. Can you hear me now? Hello, sir.
Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? We can't hear. You. Hello, sir. Hello, I'm listening. I can hear you. We can hear you now, sir. Can you hear me? I can hear you too. You're welcome, sir. You're welcome, Professor Wolabi. You're on now. Thank you. Can I start? Can I start? Please. 
I can I can continue. Yes, sir. You are on. You are on. Okay. Okay. You can hear me. So I can see. You can hear me. It's okay. Hello, sir. So, uh, let me just appreciate the. Hello. 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 Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go on, sir. Okay. Uh, let me just appreciate for instance, the chairman for the adult staff they are taking to put this conference together against all of uh, and uh, I'm uh, how we're talking on something that bothers all our credits. And I think uh, it will be very useful, especially to younger academics. And that has to do with research from conception to publication. Research from conception to publication. And uh, I now, what exactly do we understand by research? And particularly as regards academics and uh, in particular, can they just try to research something or looking for something to solve a problem, to identify a problem? We are going to come to that. You identify a problem. There's always a problem that requires a solution. And the solution can only come through a search for it. That's what we mean by research. And in most cases, we want to find out what exactly, after our research, we want to put our findings to the public to see. And that's what we are actually looking at under the purpose of academic writing. We want to inform people. We want to tell people a problem we have identified and a problem we have researched and a solution that we have found to that problem. In most cases, most academics do not achieve their purpose. And the major purpose in most cases is getting published. They don't achieve their purpose because they do not really know what people out there are looking for, what they want to see, what will interest them. And uh, in most cases, something to prestige an academic writing to achieve the intended purpose. So since this is a workshop and not a talk show, I want those who are participating in this workshop to do something. You will make a list of some subjects you have researched in the past. Maybe you have done something in the past. Just make a list. Now you ask yourself some questions. What sources did you use to source information when you are doing the research? What sources did you use? Now, usually many sources are available. Some are difficult, some are easy. Which of the sources was difficult and why did you find those sources difficult? Now, which of the sources were easy? And why did you find them easy? These are some of the things you have to find out. Because it will guide you in further research. If you have found a place or a source very difficult, you may want to find a way of avoiding that source. If you find the source very easy, you want to find out a source, you want to find out why it is easy and why you may have to stick to that one. Now, in every research, there must be a problem. Like I always tell my research students, I tell them, this is not the time to go to the mountains to pray that there will be no problem. You must, there must be a problem in research. So the things that you look out for is what exactly pricks you and makes you curious. Something must have pricked your heart. Maybe as a language teacher, maybe some things in the classroom or some things out there in the public, in the media, in print, in speech, and so on and so forth. There must be something that pricks you and makes you a little bit curious. For example, let's consider the following. Have you heard that 
in a few years' time, there will be flying cars to beat traffic. That will make me curious. That will make me curious. Did you know that some ancient kingdoms were actually made famous by women? I want to find out. That's a little bit of prequel. I'll make you a little bit curious. Unusual discovery will prompt you to want to inform others. If I've discovered something, you want to inform others. I want to tell others what you have discovered. Curiosity drives research. That must be something that clicks to. That must be something that you have found that is old, that is not out of place, that's a problem that is agitating your mind, that you think others should know about. So curiosity drives research that eventually culminates in writing a report on it. Now, this is a workshop again. Let's look at it. You as a person, maybe as a language teacher, or as a literature teacher, for example, in any aspect of language or any aspect of literature, what is it that has made you curious? What is it? Something must have made you, are you in the classroom? You are walking on the street. You are in a gallery. You are reading a text. You are reading a circular. You are reading something. Something must make you curious. What makes you curious? Find out. You must start from there. There's something that must make you curious. Now, what problem have you discovered in your discipline? What is it? Is it language use? Is it literature as a means of, you know, changing society? Whatever. There must just be something. There must be a problem that you have discovered in your discipline. With that one now, you make what I call a wonder log. Now you want to find out some things. I wonder how literature can be a weapon of societal change. I want to find out. I wonder why politicians are insensitive. Well, through literature, you can do something in that area. I wonder why language is difficult to learn. After puberty, these are some of the things that you wonder about. These are some of the things from your curiosity. These are some of the things to find out. So from here, there's going to be what I call this is development. Now, what is this is development? And how long and where should it be in the scholarly writing? Now, your problem will lead you to identify a thesis that is something you want to write about, something you want to talk about. And now with that one now, when you have identified a problem, you have identified the problem you have defined it, that time will define the shop topic. So that's what we look at the next slide. Topic choice and inverted pyramid. Topic choice and inverted pyramid. Now, you want to find out when you are Looking around, when you have identified the problem, it is usually very wide. And in some cases, you are limited by so many things, resources, time, and so many things will limit you. To the extent that you cannot look at the whole garbage of the problems that you have identified and the areas of possible uh, way of looking at these things. That's why I would say you look at from general to specific, it's the thing was first of all called to you generally, from general to specific. Is that okay then? From there, from broad subject to narrow, it usually will come in a very broad way, but you find a way of narrowing it. Is that okay? Then from narrow to focused topic. Can you see anything? It was about a part of you very wide. Then you look at it generally. Then you begin to find a way of narrowing it down. That's why we are now inverting the pyramid. The pyramid is wide, dense, it is broad. You have a very broad subject. Look at the example to have there, in the diagram we have there. Look at language. You cannot, that cannot possibly look at everything about language. It's such, such a wide area, you cannot possibly look at everything about language. It's really in one research endeavor. So maybe, for example, one aspect of language you want to look at is multilingualism. And multilingualism itself is broad enough. You still cannot possibly look at everything but multilingualism. Maybe what you want to look at effects of multilingualism. I use now you see language from the general language to the broad multilingualism, then to specific, what to look at effects of multilingualism. I look at literature, for example. 
is the literature is also a very wide area. I don't also look at everything about literature. So maybe you want to look at the broadest literature and society. Look at how literature impacts society or how society affects literature. Then you see that with the change. In other words, how does literature change society? But look at another one area, another area as I participated there. Second language teaching is also very wide. I don't also look at everything of a second language teaching. We want to go to challenges. Then maybe after the challenges, possibly the prospects that are there if you overcome those challenges. So we have tried to look at this from general to specific, from specific to the broad area, from broad to narrow. It is then that will now lead you to a specific topic that you want to look at, or a focused topic that you want to look at. Now, as a workshop tool, identify some subjects that fascinate you. You cannot get a barrel and do this one, and you can develop this one later after the conference. Identify some subjects that fascinate you. Choose one you want to research, just one out of the general that, that you have. Choose one that you want to research. Then use this method we have used, inverted premise, to pin it down to a focus topic. Pin it down to a focus topic. That focus topic that will give you the title of your research, the title of your research that will work on. And don't forget that every title, when you start a research, is a working title. As we walk along, the work can eventually change the title, and the title can actually give formal change to the work. Now, once you have done your research, you have identified the problem, you have identified, you have narrowed it down to a specific topic. Now, you have done your research. You have an audience. There are people who want to read your work. People are interested in reading your work. The editors are there to read your work, for example. The publishers are there to read your work, for example. So I want to look at purpose and audience in academic writers. Now, okay. You first of all have to discover new and unusual surprising facts. That is the only thing that can instruct your audience. If you are hammering on the old thing, if you are beating old path, nobody will be interested. That's one of the things we have taught students in recent times. That you don't, we talk our colleagues in recent times, that you don't tell me that there are no problems in life. We are still working on some old, old problems. There are some problems that have been overflowed. There are some parts that have been overbeaten. They don't have to try those parts again. You discover new and unusual and surprise. Those are the things that will stress anybody. Is that okay? Now, I want to share the, what is the purpose? I want to share the information of facts with colleagues, with government, organizations, with editors and companies, and so on and so forth. Like I said, it was about sharing old information. Nobody is interested in old information. That's why at times these days, when students come up with research topics, and I, I tell you what exactly. Do think it's still this topic? Look for some kind of so that's what I mean about sharing all the information. Now create a KWS chat according to for national development. There are challenges in language and literature teaching. Now, what I want to know, what do I want to know? I know these are facts. Digital and language can be used for national development. I know there are challenges in language and literature teaching. But what do I want to know more about this? In other words, what is the place of language and literature in national development? Then we want to want to look at the reasons for neglect in language and literature. But before now, 
some of these things you have to find out. Now, in the course of the research, what have you learned? Before now, you know that digital language can be true of vaginal development. There are challenges in language. Like I said, even when you are looking at all things, you must find a way of looking at it in a new way. So what exactly have you learned? Now you can make a KWL list of your own. But first of all, identify what you already know about a particular topic. What have you know about a particular topic? Then what do you want to know more about it? What exactly do you want to know more about that topic? And then what you learned about it through your research. That must be, if you, if in the course of research, you are still finding what others have said in the past. You are still recycling the what's it. Like I said earlier, nobody would be interested. What you want to know more about it. And then in the course of your research, through reading and all other things, what you learned about it, you must also let us know. Now, in the course of research, definitely, uh, like we said earlier, some people will say nothing is new. Literature is very, very essential. That's why we're looking at literature review, sources and documentation. My other father, why do I have to look at old works? How do I have to look at literature in the research report? What is the essence? You see, when you look at what others have done, this is one of the areas to help you to know what has not been done, to avoid beating an old path. You know what has been done so far and what is yet to be done? That is one essence of this story. But in the course of looking at your literature too, a lot of things will come up, like what you find out. You find out, for example, how things are done. In the course of literature, for example, you stumble on theories that you use. In the course of literature review, for example, you stumble on different methodology. When you're looking at other people's work, when you're looking at it, the method you want to use to do your work. Because at times, some people are confused about the methodology they want to use. So then in the course of your literature review, what should you prioritize your literature search? What should you prioritize? In every research topic, there are keywords, or what we call variables that are very important, that are very germane to that topic. So those are the areas that are going to prioritize. It's not as if uh, it's a kind of a situation where you just look at just almost everything. Look at the topic you have arrived at. What are the key, what are the variables there? Then don't forget that currency is also very, very essential in digital review. In other words, how current, the currency of your work, the work you are reviewing. Like I, I've always told people, I expect as, as least as, you know, most of us as uh, academics in our various areas and various institutions, we should look at no less than 70 to 80% of our work should be recent. But that is the only way you can actually know that the facts are presenting to your audience, that the facts are not obsolete. They are not overtaken by events. If you are looking, for example, in the current situation, for example, and you are still citing works written some 20, 30 years ago, then you can be sure that some of the facts will be presenting that you will be relying upon in your research will no longer be valid and can no longer you know, support you know, your work. I'm not saying, however, that, I, that you cannot consult old work. That's why I said that gave, I gave a percentage. Not less than 70, 80%. There are some seminar works. What I mean, seminar, I mean S E M I N A L. That's some, some classics that you cannot but refer to in the course of you know, reviewing literature. You can look at those ones. But that will not dominate. Even those seminar works I'm talking about, there have been improvements on them. There have been developments on them. Look at the new developments that are there. So in a sense, we're saying avoid very old works. In what we recommend these days is that 
work such as in current research must even be under 10 years old. Works published last 10 years. So we will tell you the works are not there. The works are there uh, on, our, on our tab laptops, on our phones and tablets. We have the virtual library there and you can consult almost everything. There are papers, uh, almost everything, that are loaded almost on, not even on daily basis now, almost civil per minute. New findings, new journals, new publications that are loaded on the internet. We can avail ourselves of some of these things. So let's not still be talking about old literature. Now, when we are looking at literature as well, you have to be sure again the sources. In other words, how credible and authoritative? How credible and authoritative are these sources? In other words, you don't just say somebody published somebody something in a very local, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, I, I was reviewing one paper recently, and somebody, an academic, was, was saying that uh, was at one of the papers submitted for promotion, something in a local magistrate conference that was never reviewed. I was ever published and you are cited that one. What is the source of your information? You are talking about how credible is that source? Is that okay? Those days that we're talking about uh, Q1, Q2 journals, is that okay? Is that okay? And they are there and available for us. So let's look at where we are citing, which we are citing. Are they authoritative? Are they credible? Or we just because we want to part your literature, we want to part your references, this. Want to part your, you want to make it look as if you are and just put every manner of thing there. Look at the credibility of the source of your literature, not just anywhere, not just anything. It must be from authority. Now, again, like I said earlier, are correct. It must be correct and adequate. It is. I'm talking about adequacy. You see, most often some researchers or some reports or some papers will tell you that. That they have not found anything reaching on this area. That uh, yeah, they, they look as if they are the first to write a situation. That is not true anyway. It may not be true. It's, you can, it can be true to the extent that you have not read enough. You have not read enough. So that is, if you do a daily literature, you just got to what to consider new. May not be new after all. And that's some of the things why papers get rejected because you think you have done the perfect job, everything. And someone will just look at this. It's something you have read maybe three, four. Go. And because you have not read wide enough, you think you are still what you are thinking or what you think what you are doing is new. It will not really be new. Yeah? It will not really be new. Yeah. It will not be new. So that's what I'm talking about currency and adequacy. How does adequacy come in? If you have read adequate enough, you know, if you read wide enough, you will discover that what you think is new is not new. Is that okay? Then we're talking about documentation techniques, so plagiarism. Now, I think uh, now there are softwares to check plagiarism. Uh, very, very serious ones now these days. Uh, like in my university, for example, for, uh, for, for any final thesis of dissertation, it was something less than 25%. That is the first mark, 25%. So there, there are different softwares now to test that one. But what I'm saying is this. Keep a tap on all the works consulted. What I do personally as an individual, now, I don't have this of uh, cards that we use. Because you can say, what I do as a person is get a notebook, an exercise book. Once I want to cite any work, or when I want to read any work that is relevant to my work, I've decided I'll use this work. I'll put the whole thing there. The author, the date of publication, the title, the publisher, the place, and everything that is there. Then I'll begin to when I read, if I find anything that is essential, if I want to quote directly, I'll put it in quote. I'll put the page immediately. If I want to paraphrase, I'll paraphrase, but I'll not put the quote. I'd like to know. You may still have to talk more about this one. Is that okay? On how to do citation, depending on the sources you are using. Whether you are using APA for those of us who are in language, or we're using MLA for those of us who are in literature. So to avoid plagiarism. The best thing is that as you are reading and you are compiling your literature, keep a tab on the works you are citing. Make sure that if it is a direct quotation, make it. And we, these days, we try as much as possible to, uh, to avoid direct quotation because that's what makes 
the percentage of plagiarism to be very, very high. When you use, when you use, when you use reputation, you can paraphrase. But please let us note one thing. Whether you are using the quotation or you are paraphrasing, you must acknowledge every author cited must be acknowledged. Whether it is direct quotation or whether it is a paraphrase. If it's direct quotation, you must push the page. It is, I mean, I may want, for example, I may want to check, for example, what is uh, uh, that page. I may want to check to confirm, for example. So if it's a direct, direct quotation, that is what we call verbatim quotation, you put the page. But if it's a paraphrase, you don't have to put the page. But in either case, you must still acknowledge the author. You must check the author. I think the APA seventh edition or sixth edition, I think it's more common than seventh edition now. You see, when you are citing, it is recommended that any direct quotation that is less than 40 words must run, will run to the lines in quotation marks and acknowledge appropriately with the page. But if it is more than 40 words, it is expected that you indent it. So that, in that, in other words, you, 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 you use a kind of a block paragraph, you indent it. And don't forget, when you indent, that is more than 40 words and you indent, what you call, some people call this set of lines, they must not be quoted again. Once you use, uh, when you once, once indent or set of lines, don't quote again. Quotation and indentation are talking about, they are both, you know, means of highlighting. If it's run into the lines, less than 40 words, put in quotation and put the author and put the page appropriate. And I don't forget, you only put the surname, only the surname. And don't forget, I think upper sixth edition, which is still very common, for first citation, you use, you cite all the authors, unless the authors are more than six. Subsequently, you don't use at all. But even I think uh, uh, seventh edition now permits using at all from the beginning. It does not even look as first citation. But I think the sixth edition is the, about the most common. So, if it's, so on, the law of process says that when you are citing a group of authors for the first time, you cite all of them. Subsequently, you use at all. Use at all subsequently. So, make sure that every author is cited to apply plagi plagiarism. So in most cases, like I said earlier, your literature review will lead you into a theory. Since for language and literature, you will look at the theory, the language, and literature research. Now the question is, what is a theory? What is a theory? Now some people say a theory is an already developed body of knowledge and already developed what is established and is a basis for other things, basis for others, you know, to follow. Now, the question is this, why is theory essential in research? If I say it's a body of knowledge already established, why is it essential in research? Like some people will tell you, they say theory drives research. Theory helps you to monitor your work, to make sure it does not, you know, derail. You make sure when you are writing, and you already have a theory you are using. You make sure that your work is situated in that theory, and that theory continues to guide your work. It doesn't help, it doesn't allow you to derail. And there are many theories that you have in both language and literature that you can use. So what you should do is identify a particular theory that matches your work. I will not say use this theory, use that, but your topic will determine your theory that you're going to use. So identify a particular theory that you think is relevant to your work. And make sure that you work along using that theory to make sure that that theory directs and shapes your work as appropriate. Now, like I said, or like I want to say, uh, how can I identify an appropriate theory? Like I said, your topic, your research problem will help you to identify, and there's so many of them in language, in literature, there are so many of them, so many theories. Now, I think at these days now, people are now going more going to pragmatics now. That's one people who came most of the time now. Uh, I've always said this one. We are almost, in some cases now, almost reading from our core values. We have almost touched the core areas 
We're now looking at uh, areas that people call soft options, areas that are easy, pragmatic, social linguistics, and, and everything. I, I think I've had course, I, I think other than this platform, on a platform or, 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 or Eastern platform, that we have almost reached, that we are almost, of us, some of us have left the philosophy where some English departments are established. We're now going to some other areas. But that's not the issue today. So look for a theory, either in language or in literature, that matches the world. Like for example, those of us in literature, one thing I've discovered in recent times now, we're not talking more about environment. We're talking about eco-criticism now. More of it. So you look at the topic. Look at the objectives. Look at the, uh, what's it called, the problem. That will help you to identify a specific topic that will help you. So, like I said, how do you apply the identified theory to work? Make sure the principles, the tenets of that theory are used to guide your work. It will guide your work, it will show you how this works. I mean, how your work fixes that theory, I had that theory, orders or directs you know, your work. Now, we'll talk about the SAC method. In, in, in the past, until very recently, we have always felt that in the humanities, there is something like research method. We have always, you know, thought that research method concerns only those in the uh, social sciences, the sciences, and the humanities. But today now we have research method. There are research, different research, there are no methods that we can use. So when we're talking about research methods, I, 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 there was a time I had a running battle on this area. What is research method in teacher? And I've tried to let them know, whatever technique you use, to arrive at your findings. That's your method. Whatever technique, you have, what is method? Method is not necessary in language, it's not necessary in digital, it's only confined to education, confined to social sciences. Concept. We have method, we have our method as well. Now, talking about data, in fact, those, some of our colleagues in literature, in the past, you don't want to hear anything about data. What do you mean by data in literature? The classic, what constitutes data in research? Well, this will be discipline specific. It depends on the area you're looking at. What constitutes the data? What constitutes data? This is how we have always had problem mainly is our colleagues in literature. It's what to mean by data. It sounds so strange talking about data. They think it is something that is, uh, looks like Greek to them. But that is data. Whatever you select from your text that you want to analyze, that's your data. That's your data. Those in language are not even as scared as those in literature. We have data in almost everything. Data simply means raw information. Whatever you are, if you are selecting, for example, uh, sentences that want to, that's your data. That will cost data. Now, the question then is this. If you have uh, agreed that we have data in both language and literature, then how do you gather your data? There are various methods of you know, get data gathering. So many methods, uh, which, may, which may not be able to discuss today. Some of us are already getting familiar with this one. Uh, you have, for example, uh, the use of uh, what we call sample and sample technique. Every report has sample. We have sample. You select, when you're talking about population in research, you're talking about population. Population simply means the whole gamut of everything covered by that research. For example, you want to look at style in maybe Shimamanda Adishes, uh, one of what one of the novels, for example. I said, how do I gather that? What is the data there? What is the data there? Well, this want to look at style, the, the way of writing, so to say. Then, how do I gather data in that movie, for example? What method do I use to gather data that is that, for example? For example, I've always told some of our program students that one of the areas or one of the main techniques you can use is what I call the systemic technique. Is that okay? So people have always felt that uh, the most common they have always used or that you actually used to is this uh, random sampling. And I said random sampling is not as easy as you think. Even in the social sciences at times, when we go to examine the social sciences, we will discover that what they, the way they understand random sampling is quite different from how random sampling works. Is that okay? But even in literature, we can, it's possible for us to use random sampling. Random sampling simply means that you have access to all the population, the entire population, and that every subject is capable of being sampled or being selected. But that is not the case 
That's not the way many people understand that nothing. They just think it's accidental. They just pick anything randomly. No, that is it. All the people must have equal chance of being selected. For those of us in the show, for example, when you look at the style of a particular work, you can use what I call the systemic, that is to select pages where you are going to use. The systemic method simply says you should select the end page. The end page. In other words, you can start from page five. In other words, every fifth page, five, 10, 15, 20, all through from the beginning of the book to the end. From the beginning of the book to the end. So it's from those pages now that you want to select the elements you want to use. Those are the elements of style that constitute your data. For those of us in language, maybe it will be easier. Maybe easier. Some of us use uh, the very common, uh, what's it called now? It's this way to call it, a questionnaire. This questionnaire. But what I've discovered again is this. For those using questionnaire, some people just load their questionnaire. In most cases, what they do is look for an old thing and gather even data that are not relevant to their research. You don't need to gather. As I would they just they, they want to still put biographic, I mean, uh, biographic data information. What when it is not part of the video, it's one of the videos you say. Only when you are when you are preparing your questionnaire. What you should do is get your research objectives. Draw your question in line with the objectives. If you have research questions, make sure that when you gather, when you collect your data, they will help you to answer those research questions. And those research questions will help you to realize the objective. Research is interconnected. It's, they don't run parallel. That's why at times I tell students, when, they, when, they're, work, when they're working on their, on, their, on, their, on their research, working on their thesis or dissertation, and they say they finished chapter two. They said I finished chapter three. We have not finished. No chapter is exclusive. No chapter is runs parallel to the other. You will discover that when you have finished chapter one, you go to chapter two, you see the part of chapter one, because you have been looking at some elements you have discussed in chapter one that will help you to review your literature. When you get to chapter three, methodology, when you go to chapter four, we are discussing your data. You see, you have to go back to chapter one. You go to chapter one to make sure that the data you are analyzing and discussing will help you to answer questions, the start questions you have said, the start questions will help you to realize your data. But I've discovered in the past that these things just run parallel. As if once you finish chapter one, you can never go back there. When you finish chapter two, you can never go back there. When you finish chapter four, you can never go back there. You always, they run, it's a kind of interconnection. They connect. It's not something that uh, is if no one is independent, they interconnect. So data is very essential in research because whether you like it or not, you need your data to convince you know, your reader, to convince your audience, to convince the editors, for example, that want to publish your paper. You mm -hmm. need the data to convince your, 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 your what's it called? Your supervisor, for example, to convince your external examiner, for example, you need the data. You need your data to do that one. So then the question is, how do you treat data in research? How do you treat data in research? Well, when you are looking at the, your data, one thing is say, be as much as possible faithful to your research, your data. Don't try to manipulate your data. What you have in mind will be different from what your data will reveal. But stick to your data. That could be what you are contributing. Maybe already you have an idea that these are the things, this is where there are some established facts. You will find out by the time you go to the field, you can turn the avocats. You can discover that your findings now are completely opposed to what you know people already believe. That could be what are contributing. Don't try to say, well, this is what other people believe. Don't try to force your data to align with other people. When you are discussing your, your research findings eventually, you will discover that you are either validating or you are nullifying already established facts. You can validate and at the same time. You can notify already said by your current finding, as long as you're faithful to your data without manipulating them. So make sure that you choose your data. And depending on uh, what you are doing, you can either do a qualitative or quantitative analysis of the data. For those of us in the system, most often we do a qualitative analysis. Those of us in language, now they say you do quantitative, where you have to refer, or where you have to rely on some, uh, have to rely on some uh, statistics. Is that okay? So now, what are the features? When you are found out all that, what are the features of academic writers? 
In other words, how is academic writing different from other forms of writing? Don't forget, you have formality. It is very, very formal in language and truth. Very, very formal. Is that okay? It is very objective in thought and analysis. Very, very objective in thought and analysis. Organization, it is usually in line with this house style, depending on where you, where, where, you, where you want to publish. Is that okay? Then conciseness. Now, I've only about cloud courses and Some people want to, I, I won't say the student who was a journalist before coming into academics. He will always want to write using flowery language. Academic writers do not permit the use of flowery language. Be very, very concise, very objective, very formal. There is no use for use of flowery language. Then, logicality. It must be very logical, very formal, very logical, both in thought and uh, expression. Now, have you run off your research? Running off a research? Running off your research? Well, what is your conclusion contain? When you're finally, you have done everything, what your conclusion contain? Your conclusion should normally look at a kind of an overview of your objectives and the methods you have used to realize those objectives. Is that okay? And then, when you are writing up, are there recommendations you want to give, for example? Are there recommendations? Yeah, okay. And what is the name of this recommendation? If there's any recommendation, no. Those of our colleagues in the show will tell you there's something like a recommendation. I know some of our colleagues in the say, what's the use of recommendations? Whoever, you know, implements those recommendations? Well, it's because we have made, you have not made it uh, uh, powerful enough. If you come to like powerful enough, we can still become a very relevant society. So, in your recommendations, make them as point. But the recommendation must arise from your findings, not something you have thought about you want to force on us. We have seen cases where recommendations are completely at variance with objectives of the study, just because what they already don't have in mind. They just load it, what they have in mind. Your, your recommendation must arise from your findings. Is that okay? They let us know who should be the beneficiaries of your research and how they will benefit from research. That's exactly what you look at. When you look at you know, uh, the significance of the study. Who will be the beneficiaries and how will they benefit? Is that okay? Then finally, we have the, I'm not finally now, we have the final uh, references list. Now, what is the importance of this? Final references list. You know, we've said this one, we are talking about literature review. The final references list is a complete, a total compilation of only works cited. This is different from bibliography. Bibliography, bibliography uh, may be used to be all works that are relevant to the story, but not so. But the final references this refers to only the works you referred to, only the works you cited, not the ones that are relevant, only the ones. So you must, it, and you must make sure that all works cited in the body are cited or are reflected in the final references list. I make sure that the reference list contains only work cited in the body of the work. That's what it should contain. Is that okay? Uh, look, I've made the difference between the final references and the bibliography. Now, then what is the house type of the possible publishing outlets? So that will now determine how you are going to do the final editing to make sure that it's some some publishing houses or different publishing houses may have different items. Even those of us who still research, we see when we were examining, you know, uh, postgraduate works, we saw that from one university to the other, there are different styles. Now, for example, in some universities, you say the abstract will be just one paragraph. Some you say the abstract will be four paragraphs. Like I said, this is discipline specific. It depends on the faculty or the university or who the department, as the case could be. That you see. Then finally, we look at the abstract. Somebody will ask me, why is, the, why is abstract coming last? Where is abstract coming last? Well, I've always said an abstract, which usually is the first thing we we'll see at the beginning, is a summary of what we have done. That's what I'm discussing with last. In other words, after you have completed the work, that's why you now write the abstract to reflect what you motivated to work, how you carried out, the situation you use, your findings, your recommendations, if they are right, and then the conclusion. That's what the abstract So, so that when you see the abstract, the abstract is like the window on the work, the work. When you see the abstract, you can see the entire work. So that is also that you cannot possibly write abstract first. But this may be different from the abstract for those uh, some organizations that are asking for 
proposal. But that's not for a paper or for a research work. Should come, should be written last, though it will come first. It should be written last, though it will come first. Uh, I hope with the little time we have spent, I hope I've not bothered, I've not bored you too much. So I want to come to the end of this presentation. Thank you for the opportunity given to me. God bless you all. Thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. Please, would like to give room for our virtual, virtual attendants. Uh, attending uh, around. Please, if you have Concerning the abstract, most of the time, you actually ask to submit the abstract of a paper. Most of the time, the paper is not completely ready, but we are asked to submit the abstract of the paper. Is it still okay to change the abstract even after you've submitted an abstract already for um, the conference party you are writing to? Is it okay to still change the abstract when you are done with your paper? like submitting something else and having something else in the paper. That happens most of the time when we are asked to just submit abstract and you want to meet with the deadline and all of that. Is it okay to have, have submitted one abstract and change the abstract later on? Did you hear me, sir? Give everything, we answer the question I will respect, I mean, I will respond at the time. Okay, sir. Yeah. Is that the other question? No, we have one more question. Okay. Thank you, Prof, for that uh, beautiful presentation. I do not hear the difference between the photography and, um, and the uh, referencing. Reference. Yes. This. Expand shades on the difference. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you, sir. So, so I can to... respond. Okay, one more question, please. Okay. Thank you both for that presentation. My name is I'm Dr. Lupe, Dr. Lupe, Lupe. Um, mine is on the use of uh, tenses, English tenses. Okay. Uh, particularly as a uh, guys. Uh, Uses of English tenses in the abstract. Use of abstract, the conclusion and the, the recommendation. These are the areas that I want you to put into use of tenses. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. That's that all. Okay, okay. Thank you for the questions. On the abstract, like we have rightly noted, usually the, the abstract will say in most cases are more or less like intent or proposal. If you have sent the abstract, at the end of the day, you will discover that what you have in the final research and the findings will completely negate what you have in the abstract. Where it can be changed is okay. But I personally have always said, I prefer calling it proposal or intent. It's like what you want to present. But most often you send the abstract, but your findings will completely, will completely be at variance with what you have to ask. Is that okay? So when that is the case, when the paper is finally reviewed, you can, in most cases, the abstract is not even published other than the book of abstract, which is, you know, some kind of value anyway. So you can change the thing later. But I personally prefer calling it proposal. If, I, if you want to uh, participate maybe in a conference or, or the certain article, well, but if it is called abstract, there is no problem. Depends on the outstyle, like I said earlier, you can share it later. And the difference between references and bibliography for those of us, this is a we shall call it works cited. It makes it very beautiful. In other words, that final list must not contain anything that is not cited in the body of the work. It is same to language, we call it references. It must not contain anything that is that we want to refer to in the work. 
what we call bibliography, or the difference between the two, references and bibliography, is that in bibliography, it contains all works that are relevant to the work, to the current research, whether cited or not. But you surely don't permit that one. We we'll limit ourselves to only the ones cited, only the ones referred to. Is that okay? Now, on the use of tense, for example, if I write in an abstract, definitely, uh, or what I call a proposal, definitely it should be in the future tense because we have not people carry that one out. It's a statement of intent. But when it comes to maybe the literary review, for example, we have always insisted on consistency and the preferred tense is present tense. Because any written work is a living thing. It never dies. A book is a living thing. Once it is there, it lives forever. It's never dies. So that's why we often use you know, present tense. But the final abstract too, is that okay? The abstract to send before the thing, you use the future tense. But when you are carrying out the work now, you want to change. It would rather be the present tense. Which is usually the preferred one. Well, there are some, there are some publishing outlets that prefer the use of person because they consider it a report. They consider it a report. But it's something you have finished and you carry it out and consider it a report. But usually, the more acceptable form is to use the present text. I hope I'm clear. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. I yeah. is not a question. I what uh, you have said. the person okay. was the differences between um, bibliography and referencing. Yes. Prof at one point. Another thing is that you number bibliography, but you cannot number references. Yes. Okay, and don't forget the most great alphabetically. Yeah, you will take note of that. Yes. They share together, they follow chronological order. They share yes. together. Yes. Now, to the issue of um, uh, abstracts, there are different kinds of abstracts. If you have completed the work, before that abstract, they, they request to submit an abstract. So, of course, they will, because you have completed, you have done everything, it will be in the past. But the one that is futuristic is that they have not done that work, but you have the intention, even that is divided into two, you have the intention that before that conference, you must have completed that. Of course, it's futuristic, the issue of will and the rest of that will come up. Then the other one that more often we find ourselves in is actually a professor, which is more elongated than what we refer to as abstracts. So under that situation, of course, it is also futuristic. Coming to the uh, question of uh, the use of um, things, of course, your, your methodology, because you had completed this work and you are reporting that it has to be in the past. But when you are making a discussion, just like Prof. said, it's, a, it's living, it's alive. So it has to be the present for the consistency matter. Because we have seen even when some students submitted their, um, uh, the same thing, maybe their work, or even when uh, many of us you know, saying in our work for assessment or we want to publish, you just see the mixture. So you cannot place, you know, what that person is saying. I think we really need to, to note. I think that will be the last one. See, disciplinary research, we uh, uh, most time go outside APA. That follows this uh, chrono uh, chronological way of arranging. If you are using numbered, 
That's what we call number. Instead of putting uh, uh, GD and Wally 2015, you just put one, two, three, four, particularly if you write on triple, I triple E and so on. So in that case, is as the referencing appears in your text. That's how it's going to appear, or your citations. That's how it's going to, it's different from end notes also. Then you have the end note, particularly those who do law. If you, if you try to write with a lawyer, you are going to go through a lot because you must have even footnotes for each other. So all I'm just saying is we should just keep uh, an open mind. Uh, I was introduced to EndNote as a software, as add-on to Microsoft Word, then later I moved to Mendeley. With EndNote, I don't need to even bother about which reference system I'm using. Uh, Hello? Uh, well, it's been so interesting. I want to thank our very senior colleagues, especially our patron, all the way from our prayer since yesterday. Please let's clap. And uh, the presentation this afternoon, Pratica. Very, very, in fact, I know many of us will go back to our classrooms, okay, renew, and definitely has promised to, to, to even give us more of the workshops online. Please, we are going to prepare for that in Ilaro, and of course, we'll still ask for more, sir. So we're grateful, sir. Uh, want to thank our president. In fact, he has been making me to work for the past two months now. Almost every day, day and night. <laughs> Thank you, ma. We appreciate you, ma. Professor Gordon Day, Mama, you are welcome, ma. Thank you also for your support. All the members of ESCO, uh, Dr. Kukola, everyone. I want to thank you. Uh, and then I want to thank the Natricel family. Definitely, we can raise our heads up in Ilaru now. No, today, people saw. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, well, like before, you say I English people and that they saw that uh, we are very very relevant. So I want to thank everybody. Tomorrow, uh, we will not meet here. We are going together at the Faculty of uh, Engineering. We call it Engineering Complex, just close by here. Uh, uh the. Engineer here is from there, he's one of the HODs. So we have rooms there. Since we are going to break into parallel sessions, okay, and some people, in fact, 70% of the presenters will be online. So, and even those who will be presenting uh, physically here, I mean, they will uh, need to link up, okay, because of the Zoom room. We are using a uh, Zoom room, okay, for our presentations. So, morning. By uh, 10, we just moved down to the School of Engineering. Okay. The... Okay. Okay, she's 
online. All right, Professor Bolani Akere Dulali. Thanks so much, ma. We've been there. Yes, I didn't. Okay, I didn't really look at that. And everybody in the morning, we had Professor Zima J. Many of our members. In fact, we have the records of the attendees. Okay, definitely. I I've been watching. We have quite a lot of them. And there are some people who have been calling me here and there that please allow me in. And I told them I'm not the one. They have to see the national treasurer. So please, if there's anybody here you want, I don't have the link. Okay. Once you pay, she will give you the links and then you can hook up. President Ma. Uh, conferees. Thank you, everyone, for attending this beautiful conference. Uh, like uh, Dr. Jiboku said, tomorrow we'll kick off with the technical sessions that all, all together, we'll give you information on the, um, on the groupings and uh, the information this evening or tomorrow morning. So see you. Please can we clap again for ourselves? Thank you. Safe trip. We'll be expecting you 10 a.m. prompt tomorrow. Thank you, sir. Man. Thank you also.